Thank you, ladies. Take your Bible, please, and go back to the book of John, chapter 20. Look up, if you will, in verse uh, 25, where the disciples is talking to Thomas here. The Bible says, And the other disciples therefore said unto him, and of course this is talking about Thomas, We have seen the Lord. And he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's a pretty emphatic statement there. I will not believe. Then down in the book of John chapter 20, verse 29, the Bible talks about how Jesus spoke unto Thomas. Well, the Bible says in John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I want to speak this morning on the time we have together on dealing with a doubter. Dealing with a doubter. Uh, how is it that you can help a doubter to become someone that believes? Now, by the way, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that, yes, even Christians doubt. I believe you'll go through different times in your life when your faith is strong. I've taught here uh, in the Bible that there are five levels of a belief. There is that which is a non-belief or no belief, no faith, if you will. Then there's a time where you will have little faith. You see this evidenced even in the disciples' lives. Then there comes a time when uh, you have more faith than you have uh, much faith faith. Uh, then there comes a time when you have a great faith. And so there's different levels of faith that you see in your Bible. And by the way, you can go from one level or one element of faith to another level of faith very, very quickly. You know, a person can have full faith one day, the next day they have no faith. By the way, if you're a believer, you've experienced that. There's been times where uh, your heart is stirred. There's been times when you're excited about the things of God and you feel like anything you pray for, God is going to grant. Then there's been other times when you feel like I just cannot get through to heaven. You feel like I can pray and pray and pray earnestly, but it's just like that the walls of heaven are brass and it seems like that the doors are made of iron and they're not going to open for me and you just pray and pray and pray. Now what you have to be careful about is understand that a Christian will go through those different times in your life. Don't give up. Listen to me now. Don't give up when all of a sudden you have a low time in your life. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what you ought to do when you have a low time in your life is get more of the hearing of the Word of God in you because the Bible promises uh, that you will increase your faith by hearing of the Word of God. All right, so here's where we see Thomas. Thomas, as you know, has been named Doubting Thomas all through down the ages. So what is it that we could do to be able to help somebody that's like a Thomas? What is it that you and I could do to be able to help that person, whether uh, they are a person that doubts the sincerity of God or doubts his word, or whether it's somebody, yes, even as I said a moment ago, that is a believer, and they go through these various stages of faith in their life, what can you do to be able to help a doubter? What can you do to be able to help your wife when she doubts, your husband when he doubts, your children when they doubt, your parents, when they doubt, perhaps a grandparent or a grandchild, what do you do when all of a sudden they go through this time of disparity and it just seems like that they cannot reach heaven and it causes doubt in their life? Let me give you a couple of things we'll learn in our Bible here. Look down, if you will, in John chapter 20 and verse 25. The Bible says, And the other disciples therefore said unto him, uh, We have seen the Lord, but he said uh, unto them, Except I see the Lord. Realize this, that a doubter must see truth for himself. 
A doubter must see truth for himself. I don't know how many times a person would take and try to tell somebody about their need of Jesus Christ. I remember my dear dad. I would witness to my dad over and over and over again, but it wasn't until the time when my dad came to the reality of now I see the truth, I accept the truth, did it make a change in his life as he received Christ as his Savior. All right? So realize this. Realize that some doubters are people that are just waiting to see the truth for themselves. He said, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. All right. And so there is going to be people that say, now I'll tell you what, I just don't believe it until I can see it. Now, what do you do with somebody like that? We're going to show you in the scriptures how to be able to help somebody like that. But is there people that way? You know, sometimes a person will go through doubt because they have calamities. Sometimes a person would go through doubt because of a tragedy. Sometimes a person would go through a doubt because of a shortcoming. Sometimes a person would go through a doubt because somebody caused them to stumble. Uh, sometimes a person would go through a doubt simply because of the fact that they thought that God should have answered prayer in this relative amount of time that they've allotted for God to answer prayer and God didn't come through for them and God didn't answer prayer for them. And so because God did not answer prayer during the time fragment that they gave God to answer prayer, now they begin to doubt God. Sometimes people doubt because a parent lets them down, or because a child lets them down, or yes, because a preacher lets them down, or maybe some religious institution that's called a church lets them down. I've seen people that get out of church. Why? Because something happened in their life that they thought should not have happened in their life, and it was related to a church, and now they got bitter, and now they got upset and now they decided they're going to ex God off the rest of the days of their life. Why? Because there was that doubt that came in to their life. You know, years ago, there was Ted Turner. Of course, you may know of Ted Turner. He's the founder of CNN. He's the founder of TNT. He's the founder of TBS, a multi-billionaire, a businessman extraordinaire, uh, but a high critic of Christianity. Uh, hates Christianity. Matter of fact, in one periodical that he wrote, he said this, Christianity is for those that are losers. All right? And so a very, very anti-Christian type of man. Uh, numerous articles was written about his life. And one of these articles that had been copied all down through the years, and he has never denied it, even in that which is a public uh, interview, personal interview with him, uh, he has staked claims to this being the truth. He said, when I was a young man, I surrendered to be a missionary. When I was a young man, I surrendered to be a missionary. He said, I had great faith in God. Then all of a sudden, my younger sister, Mary Jane was taken ill. There was something that she contracted that caused her immune system to have a disease that eventually killed her. Here's a statement. He says, I was taught that God was love. I was taught that God was powerful. I cannot understand nor can I accept that God would take someone that was so innocent and allow them to suffer as he did. Well, now, wait a minute. Here's what he did. He put God on trial. He said, because God did not meet my expectations, therefore I don't believe in him. By the way, that's the way it is in our reality with relationships that we deal with normally in that which is the people that's our relatives or the, peoples that, the people that are our friends. We say, because they, I had an expectation here they did not meet that expectation that I had. Therefore, I'm going to cross them off. I will never again want to be their friend. Now, to me, that is not uh, the position that you ought to take. That's not the position that a Ted Turner should have took about his sister. He should have realized that, uh, uh, listen, if the sister is saved, ah, instead of her going through all the turmoil, all the problems of the disease, uh, eating away and causing hurt and pain and suffering and uh, uh, all those things that comes along, not just to her, but to family members, maybe God just took her home a little bit early so that she wouldn't have to go through the suffering. Isn't it amazing, however, that what we do is we always look at the negative. So-and-so said that about me. Therefore, I'm not going to be their friend. 
There's something that doesn't reign true when we think about that compared to Christian maturity. I'm saying this. I'm saying that a doubter is someone uh, that has to see things for themselves. Statement number two, a doubter must experience truth for himself. The Bible says in verse 25 again, he says, and put my finger into uh, the print of the nails. The Bible says, and thrust my hand into his side, uh, I will not believe. He said, unless I can do this, I'm just telling you right here, right now, that I'm not going to believe unless I can do this. Now I'm talking about how do you deal with a doubter? You've got to understand what a doubter is going through. Maybe that doubter is somebody that uh, they want to see the truth for themselves, but they're having a hard time seeing it because they have a, a fuzzy or a not clear vision vision as to how to see it. Sometimes a doubter is a person uh, that uh, they have to be able to experience the truth for themselves. Uh, I submit this to you. Uh, most doubters rely heavily on their feelings. They rely heavily on their feelings. Well, I feel like this is that way. I feel, you know, the Bible says that you're not supposed to go by your heart. The heart is desperate and it's wicked. And the Bible says it's desperately wicked. Can I tell you it's deceitful? Can I tell you it's not something you ought to rely on? Well, I just feel like so-and-so doesn't like me. Did they ever tell you? Well, no. Did they ever write you a note and say, I just want to let you know today you're not on my best list? No. You looked at their face and they didn't smile at you. Did you ever think maybe they're having trouble? Did you ever think that maybe they have struggles? Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about Christians. It's always thinking it's about them. You know, most doubts uh, uh, come from that heavy sensation of I've got to rely on my feelings. You know, most people judge churches that way. They do. I'm going to join a church if I walk in and I feel the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join church. I, I'm, I'm going to join that church if, I, if the music makes me feel good. If the preaching makes me feel good. Well, how about this? How about joining a church and getting involved in a church because of the truth that is preached and the biblical principles that are taught rather than a feeling? By the way, most marriages break up because the feeling goes away. Well, how about not uh, basing your marriage on a feeling, but on a principle of truth? I'm saying this this morning. Uh, emotions can lead you the wrong direction. There was a mother and a father. They just had a, a little baby, and, oh, they were so excited about their baby. And so uh, one night, the dad walked into the crib, and, oh, he's just He's looking over, and uh, he's seen the baby that's in the crib, and oh my, uh, his wife, oh, she was just so touched. She thought, wow, does he love her little baby. And so she goes in and takes her hand and be able, uh, was able to put it on his back and rub his back and pat him on the back. And, and uh, she said, uh, oh, honey, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it great that God has given us such a beautiful little baby? She said, I'll give you a penny for your thoughts. Boy, he began to cry and tears began to come down his cheek. And as he was standing there over the crib, he said, yes, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. As I'm looking at this crib, it's amazing that it only took $46.50 to make it. You say, well, that doesn't sound like that's kind. They were emotionally looking in the same direction but did not see the same thing. Did you know a lot of people are that way? Come on. You tell a joke, somebody doesn't get it, and you think, what's wrong with them? Instead of saying, what's wrong with the way I told it? You know, uh, you show up into somebody's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was telling in Sunday school, I think I mentioned this, that by the time it's all said and done uh, throughout the month of May, my wife and I will have attended between six and seven either graduation services that we're a part of or graduation celebrations uh, after services that we will attend to be able to honor a young person. You know, but some people feel as though when they walk into the room, it's E.F. Hutton, that everybody's going to be quiet and just listen to what they have to say. And they're highly disappointed if not everybody does that. 
Well, can I tell you, it, it would be nice just to be able to be the individual that God has created you to be. And a doubter is somebody that must experience the truth for themselves. But maybe you can help them to be able to experience the truth. Statement number three, a doubter needs someone, needs someone which knows the truth to be patient with them. Someone that knows the truth. Be patient with them. Uh, try to guide them and try to help them. You know, your faithfulness speaks uh, of volumes. You know, your love for God speaks volumes. You know that uh, your testimony for Christ speaks volumes. Did you know that uh, the love that you demonstrate towards others, it speaks volumes? Can I say that your private devotion speaks volumes? Somebody's looking to be able to walk in your path. My grandfather and my grandmother both taught me a little bit about hunting. They taught me how to track different animals when I was living there. And I'd take my dog, Blackie, and we'd go out and we'd go hunting. And can I tell you, I, I knew how to hunt. I knew how to track. But it's all because that they taught me some things about that. Oh, I remember one time my grandfather told me, he said, now, Mike, and I was just a young little guy, but he said, now, Mike, he said, if you ever go out in the woods and you get lost, he said, find the path that's used the most, and it'll lead you out. Oh, I remember one time I went out, and oftentimes as I was a, a teenager, I'd take my dog out, and uh, I'd grab a shotgun and maybe a straight gun, and I'd go out, and I'd just spend several nights in the woods, just throw a, a sleeping bag down, have some beans and whatnot and coffee, and I'd just go out for several nights, just tracking and hunting and just coming back, just, uh, just with all sorts of different uh, critters and stuff, and my mom would say, uh, don't kill it unless you're going to eat it. That was a rule. Don't kill it unless you're going to eat it. So there was a lot of skunks that passed me that I never shot. <laughs> but can I tell you this? Uh, those nights that I was laying out there and you look up in the starry heavens and it just uh, is so peaceful and just so wonderful to be able uh, to recognize the Creator God. But I remember one time I, I just kept going deeper and deeper in the woods and I'd gone from one person's property to another person's property to another person's property and I, I kept going. I got off path and I thought maybe I'll find some uh, good hunting spots down deeper in the woods and I left the path and all of a sudden I got turned around. You ever do that? I get turned around in Dallas sometimes. It's a woody area here. And now I got turned around. I, I couldn't figure it out. And I, I've never been one to panic real quick, but I, I got turned around. I began to think, okay, I got to find me a path. And I found me a path, but it was all grown over. And I thought, well, I don't know if that's a good one or not. Grandpa said to find one that is most used. And so I kept looking around, looking around. I found one, and sure enough, I followed it out, and it came out into the back field that I was used to seeing uh, on the hinder part of somebody's farm. And I knew exactly where I was simply because I followed the path. What do you do when you doubt? What do you do when all of a sudden you say, it's just not working out the way I thought it would? What do you do when all of a sudden uh, disparity hits you uh, broadside and it seems like that uh, doubt begins to knock on your back door? It might be good to still follow the principles that you knew was true before you ever begin to doubt. Amen. You say, well, I tell you what, I must be a bad Christian. I, I, must, I must not be somebody that is just right in there with God. Well, I, I would say that Thomas uh, was right in there with God. I would say that Thomas followed the Lord. I would say that Thomas was known as uh, one of those that was chief among those that was right in there and listening to the Lord and seeing the miracles of God. But yet in his heart, he seemed to need just a little bit more. But watch this. He stayed in there long enough that he saw a little bit more. And if you stay in there long enough, you can see God's working in your life. You can see God working in your children's life. You can see God working in your prayer life. Uh, don't be too quick to give up and to throw in the towel and just say, well, I tell you what, I just think that God is through. No, dear friend, God is not through with you. God does have a will for your life. And God can answer prayer. And God can still come through. But you've got to be that one that says, I'm just going to stay in there even during the time times of doubt, I'll stay in there and I'll serve God until that doubt goes away. May I say this? John uh, chapter, if you will, 20, watch it in verse 26. The Bible says, and after eight days 
Again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Why, you mean he joined up with these fellas? You mean these fellas that really had a strong belief? He joined up with them? You know, the best thing you can do, stand up to guys, if you will. Best thing you can do, hold your Bibles and make room for me in the middle. And so face that way. And uh, here I am, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubting. But, but I know that there's somebody in the church seems to have it together. There's another guy in the church that just kind of seems to have it together. And here I am all by myself. Man, I tell you what, I've got poochy lip disease. The bottom lip is sagging between my two big toes. I keep tripping. I can't see where to go. But I see these guys. Oh, they're not special guys. They're just average Joes. But it just seems like they got something I don't have. So if I'm going to be wise, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to kind of walk up, put myself in the midst of them. Why? Because they got something that can help me. I don't have to ask them for something. All I've got to do is just show up. That's why coming to church is pretty good for us. Because you're walking in the midst of the believers, and the believers believe the Bible, and the believers believe in preaching, and the believers believe in a godly teaching. And here's what you've done. Just by coming to church, you got around those that can help your faith. They can help your faith just because they're there. You ever see the grandparent that just keeps coming, keep coming, just keeps it coming, just keeps doing it? That's an encouragement in somebody. You ever see the mom and daddy? Oh, yes, you know they're going through hard times. Yes, you know they're going through difficult times, but they just keep going. That's a testimony to somebody. Come on. Now watch this. All of a sudden, uh, this guy gets backslidden. He goes, and goes to his house or whatever. Now, and, and now I don't have as many, but I still got one. I still got somebody I can look up to. See, that's why it's important for you to be faithful. All of a sudden, he decides he gets backslidden. Now I show up in church. I'm a visitor. I'm looking for somebody to shake my hand. I'm looking for somebody who says, hey, yes, God can. I find no one. You know what happens then? Okay, I guess God's not in that church. Guess God's not working working in that church. Guess God has left that church. Now, can I tell you this? Can I say that a doubter uh, must experience truth for himself? Then I said this, that the doubter needs someone which knows the truth just to be patient with them. Just to be patient with them. All of a sudden, there's somebody, and uh, they lay out a church, and uh, you go up to them and say, I sure did miss you. By the way, they need more than just a preacher to show up. They they need more than just a youth director to show up. They need somebody that's uh, uh, in the church and loves God and just to show an interest in them. That's why I believe this. Uh, Somebody says, well, I don't have many friends. Well, you're going to draw what you are. So if you're not friendly, I don't expect you to have too many friends. But if you want friends and you be friendly, you'll draw what you are. I have people come and they'll complain. They say, well, I just don't have any friends. I say, well, who are you being friendly to? Well, but if you'll be friendly to somebody, you just might get a friend. Look, can I tell you, I I found this out to be true. If you go up and you stick your hand out into somebody's uh, 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 space and and you stick it out like you want that hand shook, I've not been in a church where somebody slapped my hand. But what I have been, I've been in churches where you stick the hand out and because you stuck it out, they stick theirs out too. See, they become to you like you are to them. Amen. You ever see somebody walk into a crowd and they start smiling? And because they start smiling, somebody else starts smiling? Oh, you say that's cause and effect. Yeah, I think you ought to practice it. Well, I think you ought to walk in a crowd and if I'm down, it's their responsibility to make me happy. I think you ought to be happy in Jesus when you walk in the crowd. I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, here we see that the doubter needs someone that knows the truth to be patient with them. The Bible says in verse 26, the latter portion of the Bible says, and after eight days, it says, again, uh, his disciples were within, and Thomas 
with them. Now, by the way, these are all different types of people. Have you ever noticed how God uses different types of people? Peter was the boaster. He was always telling people what he thought. You know, uh, most, most people knew Peter as the big mouth. But he was always telling, let me tell you what I think about that. Now, nobody asked him, but let me tell you what I think about that. Peter was always the boaster. Uh, Andrew was always the quiet one. He didn't speak very much, but he was always there. Uh, he would be the one that would say, now, I'm, I'm just going to wait and see. He didn't speak very much. There was John. John was always the caring one. He's the one that the Savior, uh, if you would please, would come to. And he's the one, if you will, that was at the cross, beloved John. It was John that tried to get close to the Savior. It was John that missed the Savior, I believe, the most. All right? And he was the caring one. I mean, these are different types of people. You know what makes church fun? Is there's not robots. You know what makes church fun? You know what makes church fun is sometimes you show up moody. You know what makes church fun? Sometimes you show up and you've got laughter in your system and you laugh. If everybody was like me and everybody was like you, it would be a boring place. I tell jokes sometimes. They're not good. They're never good. I, I Don't do that to me. They're never good. I can't tell a joke for nothing. Even when I read it, it doesn't read right. But some of you, out of the kindness of your heart, you laugh. And I know it's, you're not laughing at the joke because you start laughing before I get to the part that's the funny part. Now, can I say this? Our church is made up of different types of people. I see some people, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. Man, I see some people when they get the hymn book, man, they're in there, man. They are just in there. And when they're singing, they're singing with great, great energy. I mean, it's like, it's like they're singing all by themselves. And if they don't do it right, I mean, it's just, nothing's going to happen. They, I mean, they give it everything like they're singing, like they're an opera singer or something. I mean, they're getting with it. I see other people, you barely see their lips move. You wonder if they're saying anything at all. Then you have people that don't know the words. Their lips move, but they're saying different words. You know? And then, then you know, you have people that they open the hymn books. Some people don't open the hymn books. Some people just, when it comes time to sing, they just hold the hymn book. And they, Brother Palmer says, get up and open your hymn book too. They grab the hymn book. They heard it just like you and me, and they just hold it. Just, you know, just hold it. You know? Everybody is different. You know, we have men in our church that say amen. amen. We do. We have men in our church, I promise you, probably will never say amen. We have people in our church that when I preach, they're with it. I mean, they're sitting on the edge of their seat. They're like, I mean, they're right there. I've got other people when I preach, they look at me like they're mad the whole time. <laughs> we have people in our church when it's handshaking time, here's what they do. They walk around, you see them, they start over here, and somehow or another, they end up way over there. They're shaking everybody. We have people in our church that they stay in their pew, and people come to shake their hand. We have ushers in our church that they would take the offering before we ask them to take the offering. They're excited. We have other ushers that's in our church. We have to remind them, offering time. I'm telling you. Now, by the way, that is what makes a church neat. That when you come to church, you get to see different personalities. God made us differently. And God made these disciples very differently. Peter was boasting all the time. Andrew was quiet all the time. John was caring all the time. You know, Matthew was serious all the time. Prior to him coming to the Lord, a tax collector, just very serious all the time. Uh, you had Philip. Philip seemed to be anxious all the time. It was come and see, come and see. 
come and see. Come and see. He was always just really anxious all the time. Now, God used these individuals and brought them together and turned the world right side up. And so God can use you. Please don't do this. Please stop this. Please stop this. Uh, uh, please don't be an individual that says, okay, I'm going to see if I can fit in somebody else's personality. Well, if you do that, who's going to be you while you're gone? God made you unique. Stop trying to put everybody in your cylinder, and if they don't fit in your cylinder and they line up with your personality, well, they're just not accepted as a good Christian. I beg a difference with you. We all have different backgrounds. We all got saved at different ages. We all have different places that we served God prior to coming to Parkside. And so God uses each and every one of us uniquely. And so can I say this? The doubter uh, uh, needs someone that knows the truth just to be patient with him. Then think about this. I'm almost done. The doubter needs extra proof of truth. Extra proof of truth. We're in the uh, book of John chapter 20 and verse 27. The Bible says, uh, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold, my hands. This is the Lord speaking to him. Then he says to reach thither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. He said, man, I got the proof right here. The problem is you're standing right there. I'm standing right here, the Lord says. Here's the proof. If you need it, reach. By the way, if you need extra proof, you have to reach. You have to reach. I was dealing with a couple not too long ago, and they said, well, I just don't really, really uh, understand if there is a God. I said, well, I can help you with that. And so uh, after a period of a couple of months or so, they said, we've come to the understanding, Pastor, with all the studying and everything. To, yeah, we're sure about it now. There's a God. A couple of months after that, one of them received Christ as Savior. But you got to be patient with people. Patient with people. Uh, uh, you know, not everybody uh, has a foundation of the gospel. So sometimes, even in witnessing and going door to door and, and uh, knocking doors and talking to people about Christ, and when I fly out on a Monday or Tuesday to speak at a conference, can I tell you, not everybody's on the same level. Not everybody has that keen understanding about the gospel or even just a little bit of an understanding about the gospel. Sometimes you got to spend more time with a person so that they come to an understanding of Jesus Christ. The doubter needs extra proof. It was John Wesley that wrote in his journal an entry uh, dated uh, May 24th, 1738. He detailed his spiritual pilgrimage. He says, I was born into a family of a clergyman. He said, I was carefully taught. Salvation can only be obtained by keeping the Ten Commandments. He said, over the years of going to school and attending a university, I had great hope that one day I might be saved. He said, not being so bad as other people, having uh, been kind to religion, reading the Bible, going to church and saying my prayers, no doubt that one day I just might be saved. He said, eventually I was even ordained as a minister. I lived strictly by the rules. I omitted no sort of self-denial. He said that one day, he said, as a chaplain in the American colonies, he said, I begin to understand it has to do something with faith. Maybe faith through Jesus Christ as I read the scriptures. After a period of time of studying faith in Jesus Christ, I came to the understanding, he said, that it's faith alone, fully reliant on that which is the blood of Christ that he shed for me, and that day I was converted. Amen. He said, ever since then, I know what it is to have blessed assurance. It's mine. Now, wait a minute. Uh, a doubter needs sometimes extra proof. Sometimes it does take time to be, and don't give up on them. My dear mother, it took her a long time to receive Christ. My dear father, it took him even longer to receive Christ. My elder brother, it took him even longer than they two to receive Christ. Don't give up on somebody. Shelton Smith would go by my mother's house and, in Maryland, and he would knock on the door, and he said, the first time I went, it was a very cold reception. 
He said, uh, Mike, she w- I remember him telling me, Mike, she was not ready to receive the gospel. But he kept going by and kept building a friendship and uh, kept talking with her and uh, spending some time with her until there was a day when she bowed her heart and she received Jesus Christ as Savior. And can I tell you, I can testify I was the very first person that she called. And she said, Mike, I've got good news. I said, what's the good news? She said, I got saved. Well, you know what? It took time. Can I tell you, it took time. It wasn't just giving her a gospel track and walking away. It wasn't just saying, okay, here's what the Bible teaches, and they say, I don't receive Christ, I don't want nothing to do with Christ, and therefore, you walk away. No, no, no. Uh, Your loved ones that are not saved, don't give up on them. Don't quit on them. Your mom and daddy that's not living for God, don't give up on them. Don't quit on them. Those that's in the community that uh, have not yet come to know Christ as Savior. Hey, don't give up on them. Don't quit on them. I'm saying this. I'm saying the doubter must see truth for himself. The doubter must experience truth for himself. The doubter needs someone that knows the truth to be patient with him. The doubter needs extra proof of truth. And let me give you this and I'm done. The doubter can become a believer in truth in time. Hello? All right, watch this. I, let, me, let me testify. When I first got saved and I went to Bible college, I came across a man by the name of Carl Hatch. Carl, Carl Hatch believed emphatically that God has called every believer to be a personal soul winner. I mean, he just believed it. He ate it, he slept it. He voiced it. I mean, he just believed it. I'm going to tell you, that man rubbed off on me. The the things that I experienced through his presence, stay with me now, rubbed off on me. I never met a John O. Rice. Never did. Never did. John O. Rice died in 1980. I received Christ in 1979. I was only six months a believer before he died. And, uh, but I never met him. One day I picked up a book. It's called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. I can testify that I've read that book at least seven times. Where I've combed through that book because that is the premier book. Though I've met, read many books on prayer. That is the premier book that God has used in my life to teach me to be a prayer warrior. There was the influence there was the rub of the shoulder. I remember when there was a fellow by the name of Hudson, Curtis Hudson, came to our Bible school where I was attending Bible college, and I owned my own business. Well, we were in partnership, Joe Schrock and I. And, uh, but because we uh, owned our own business, we were able to leave the chapel services early because we had the chart where people would go. And so we had a window washing business, and uh, we gainfully employed about 15 young men uh, at, at a time uh, towards the latter part, and God bless that business. And, and so we sat in the back, and we left a little bit early, and uh, there was a fellow by the name of Curtis Hudson that came to our Bible college. He came to the Bible college, he made an announcement. He said, if you'd like to go soul winning with me, go to the administrative building, go into the office and sign up. Well, you know, I could be the first one out, so I did. So I signed up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, I didn't know he was going to choose the person that signed up on the first line, not noticing anybody else. And so I got to go soul winning with him several times that week. I learned a little bit about soul winning through that fellow by the name of Hudson. Oh, I listened to great preaching over the years, and I sat in conferences, and I heard preachers get up, and they preached the word of God without apology, and they would uh, give it straight. And by the way, that's when America truly was great. And can I tell you, God changed my life through old-fashioned preaching. Now, may I say this? A doubter can become a believer in truth, in time. It takes time. Who are you influencing? Who are you helping that's a doubter? Who has God placed in your pathway, in your heart, that you should not be giving up on, but you should be working on more? The Bible says, and I close with this, John chapter 20 and verse 28, the Bible says, and 
Uh, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Verse 29, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me, and yet have believed. Can I tell you, it's a good day in our Christian walk, in our Christian lives, that we believe in God. Have you ever done that? Oh, you say, I'm saved, preacher, I'm saved. But how's your belief? When's the last time you ever walked through the meadow and you cried out and said, God, if, I, if you don't come through, I'm through. God, if you don't give me wisdom to be able to know what to do in this given situation, I'm going to be up the creek. When's the last time you ever reached out and said, God, you know, I've not had an answer to prayer in some time now. Matter of fact, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. It's been a year. It's been two years. God, you've not answered my prayer in such a long time. God, I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to walk in the meadow. I'm going to get out in the country. I'm going to uh, get myself in a lonely room, and I'm going to pray until you come through. When's the last time you did that? See, God wants to be real to you. But I want to submit something to you this morning. He can only be as real to you as you allow him to be to you. All these others walked in and said, we've seen him and we believe. And Thomas says, I've seen him, but I'm not going to believe unless I can take my finger and put it in the nail print of uh, his hand and take my hand and uh, thrust it into his side. I will not believe. That's your choice. I'd rather live on the believing side. Let's decide we can help the doubters. By proving that Jesus Christ is real. And the way that we walk and the way that we testify. And the way that we live out our Christian faith. Father, help us, I pray this morning.